think of scientists, what are the images that come to mind? Maybe you think of the great scientists, like Newton, or Faraday, or Darwin, who dominate the history books because of their genius. Or maybe you think of people in white coats doing mysterious things in a laboratory. We see these images so often on TV that it can be difficult to escape from them. They tend to give the impression that scientists are somehow different from everyone else. Well, I don't think they are. If you strip away the white coat and talk to them, you soon find that the people who do science are actually a lot more normal than you might imagine. In this film, I've talked to six different scientists. I've taken them away from the lab to find out what they're really like. I started by asking what they like to do when they're not doing science. I really like to write. I've published two novels. I like to write novels about scientists because there aren't that many scientists in novels. And I think that's a disgrace because scientists are really interesting people. Um, I like to keep fit. I mean, last night I went belly dancing. <laughs> Something that I like that not many other people do is baking. Um, it's good to experiment outside the lab and it's always going to have a good outcome. <laughs> I like reading. So I read a lot of books. Um, I do like juggling. I've never really progressed as a juggler. I can do three clubs but never never got much better than that. I've always liked taking photographs, so I sort of keep a photographic diary. I sort of, I carry a little camera. Let's see, I've got my little camera with me here. See, now there we've got it. <laughs> Recorded for posterity. But I am a pretty nerdy scientist, actually, if you really want to know the honest truth. Yes, please. The honest truth is exactly what we're after. So let's talk about science. When did these scientists first get interested? I've always wanted to be a scientist ever since I was tiny. I was probably about 10, 11 or 12 when I thought about how cool science was. I, I can't remember exactly how old I was, but I think I was in upper 3A, <laughs> which probably would make me about 11. I was a real geek and in fact, I was quite unpopular because I was the girl who was always sitting in the front row, raising my hand and answering the questions. It didn't endear me to my classmates, needless to say, but I love science. Uh, I think I was definitely in primary school, but it wasn't, um, now I'm a biological scientist, uh, but then it was more physical sciences that I think I was interested in. Uh, I think that was the sort of space travel thing and, and seeing shuttles going up into space that really captured my imagination. So up until the age of about six, I wanted to be a space fireman. A what? A space fireman. My, my friend Colin and I were convinced that there would be a need. We were children of the space age, which is a lot of the motivation for being a scientist anyway. And we thought there would be a real need for space firemen until we, it was pointed out to us there's no oxygen in space and so fires were pretty much going to go out of their own accord. So I was motivated by a program called Star Trek. And in Star Trek, they had this uh, Lieutenant Uhuru, who was a communications officer. And when I was growing up, there were very, f there were hardly any black uh, females in that kind of role on TV who you could identify with. Usually, the roles were either working in the kitchen or perhaps being a nurse, or it was usually um, a, a role that wasn't considered. Um, that was, that was considered more traditional for black females. And the tenant for Huru, she kind of broke that mould. And she was really inspiring. Science was cool. I look forward to biology and chemistry lessons and physics lessons because you got to do things rather than just sit uh, watching a blackboard or whiteboard or whatever. And it was active rather than being very formal and lectured at. So. Yeah, you could say that I was obsessed by science from a very early age, and, and I loved school, <laughs> so I was a bit weird. 
Because I always liked science very much and was much better at science than classics. And we spent much, much more time doing classics at the school where I was at than anything. I mean, Latin and Greek occupied all the morning in my memory. It was really tedious. But we had one science lesson a week. But also, it was my father, and he, he asked me one day, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said a number of things. And he said, well, why don't you aim for something higher? Be a doctor, you know, be a scientist. Or, but, but just aim for something higher, because he, he knew I had the ability, and he believed in me. And I thought, yeah, you're right. I'm, I am going to aim higher. Sort of over the next, I guess, three or four years, as I, as I started to grow up, became more and more interested in science. It was a time in the early 60s when you know, science was, was everywhere. People were landing on the moon. Um, my father worked for a company that sold chemicals and he would come home, he was a salesman, he would come home with the back of his car full of boxes of test tubes and things like this. And so this, that science was something quite interesting, was always rattling around in my head. But I was really an extremely untalented physicist, largely I think because my maths was very weak, still is very weak. Um, but the chemistry I enjoyed tremendously. I especially loved sort of identifying chemicals, you know, and distilling things and blowing things up, smelling things, you know, the beautiful colors and the reactions between them. And you just, it was just all terrific, really. For Sam, there was an inspirational teacher. I had some amazing biology teachers when I was in secondary, t uh, secondary school uh, and they really sort of changed my perspective on biology uh, and that's really what started me onto the path where I am today. Well, I, I loved science when I was at school, um, right from the word go. I mean, Gert Summerhoff, who was the, the, the teacher, was a particularly inspiring person because I think he sort of understood uh, what little boys liked, I mean, you know, smells, explosions cute tricks, um, making electric circuits. And I had one teacher, Miss Do Dr. Bracebridge, Dr. Bracebridge, I always remember him. He had, um, he had a metal hand, he lost his hand in the war, and uh, he became a chemistry teacher. And um, he was the one teacher that encouraged me. And he said, right, I had sparks of genius <laughs> now and again, <laughs> and properly channeled, right, I could do something with it. And uh, he really encouraged me right, to, to follow my dream when other teachers didn't. And so that, that really helped. Uh, and it was a guy called David Ensor when I was at the University of Liverpool who uh, taught neuroendocrinology. And he just discussed about molecules and how they interacted with cells and the amazing effects they can have on your body. And I just thought, this is for me. This is what I wanted to do. Whatever their sources of inspiration, they all now work as scientists, so they must be pretty smart. Have any of them got a Nobel Prize? No, I don't personally have a Nobel Prize. <laughs> no, when I was younger I thought I would A, get a Nobel Prize, and B, cure cancer. <laughs> um, no, I don't, and I probably never will. No. I don't have a Nobel Prize, I'm afraid. Love to, but I don't. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Will I ever have a Nobel Prize? I think not. I, I do have a Nobel Prize, yes. Uh, the, uh, one third of the share of the 2001 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. I did once get some advice from, from somebody I know reasonably well who has got a Nobel Prize, a man called, called Tim Hunt, who did lean over to me over a cup of coffee one day and say, Lawrence, if you're going to get a prize, get a Nobel Prize. They really treat you well. So only one Nobel Prize. But don't you need to be a bit of a genius to do science? No, I'm not a genius. I'm just somebody who knows what she likes to do. And when she's interested in something, I just work hard at it. And I remain focused and determined and committed. And I keep trying. And that's the key thing. I'll just keep trying. Uh, no, I'm definitely not a genius. No. Uh, I think I'm a person who works hard and who's interested in what she does, 
but uh, no, I'm not a genius. No, definitely not a genius. The amount of mistakes I make in the lab. I think when you're young, you think you can do everything, and when you get older, you realise it's just enough to do something. No, I don't think I'm a genius. I think occasionally I have little flashes of genius. Every now and then, I do please myself very much that I've been able to put together a bunch of facts that haven't quite made sense to, to other people or to me for quite a long time and then go, ah, got it. And that's very, very pleasing. So I'm not a genius, but I have little flashes about every 10 years. What does the Nobel Prize winner think? Is he a genius? No, 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 I'm, not, I'm no genius. No, absolutely not. In fact, my, my wife calls me the People's Laureate because she says if I can win a Nobel Prize, anybody can. <laughs> Okay then, so what does it take to be a good scientist? I think a good scientist has to be incredibly curious. He's somebody who's always questioning, not just the science, but themselves as well. You have to ask questions, but also ask the right question. So curiosity is obviously important. Is there anything else? A sort of bloody-minded refusal to fail, 90% of what you do doesn't work. You know, I try and get this through to my research students when they come bushy-tailed from their first degree, wanting, expecting to discover something. I tell you, you're going to go into a laboratory every day for three to four years and nothing you do will work. You must be someone who's prepared to just keep trying and you don't, I mean, you will get disheartened, but it's being able to pick yourself up from a setback and move forward. It takes a lot of hard work to become a scientist. And something maybe they don't tell you in, in your science class is that a lot of science, or most of science, is failure. <laughs> Except every now and then, one Friday morning, you will look down a microscope and something will have worked, and then it'll all take off, and then it'll be exciting. and that moment will justify all the slog of the previous year or two years or three years or indeed working life. So I think you have to be really, really stubborn and say to yourself, I really want to know the answer. I want to know why it's true and I want to work really hard to find out and I don't mind if I fail because I'm going to fail a hundred times and then you know that success is really sweet when you actually do discover something. It's the greatest feeling in the world. All my life, I, if I have a, you know, been successful, it's because I've made so many mistakes. And if you learn from your mistakes, the more mistakes you make, the better, because the more you learn. And you try to avoid making the same mistake twice. That's, it's, a, it's a good lesson, that, actually. But if you never make mistakes, you'll never learn anything. <laughs> you need to be imaginative, very, very imaginative. You've got to be able to think not just in straight lines. You have to be good at thinking in straight lines, but you also have to be able to take things that don't look as though they really do go together and understand where they go together. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to be brilliant. I think you just have to be creative. And perhaps think laterally. And you have to be prepared to go down a different route to the one that you thought you were going down and accept what actually maybe that's not right maybe this way is a better way and you need to have that flexibility it's an experimental it's experimental work by nature no one's done it before so you do come across problems that you have to fix and if no one's done the work doing before you have to forge new ground and i guess you've got to have a, a passion for it because nothing you do ever works statistically <laughs> And because it is a, you know, you are asking questions to which nobody will know the answer. There is no, often nobody else you can ask to help you. If you're using a specific technique that's not right for the job, then what technique can you use? And if there isn't one available, can you develop it? It's somebody that's constantly questioning everything that they do and how they do it. It takes absolutely all sorts. I don't think there's any generalisation you can you can make actually because there are so many different aspects to it you know sometimes you need somebody who will just grind away and grind away with great accuracy other times you need somebody who makes imaginative flights of fancy um, it's, it's 
it, there's no there's no rhyme or reason. Well, that's good news. You don't have to be a genius to be a good scientist, though it does take curiosity, imagination, and hard work. But is it fun? Shh. I mean, there is a thing that I get to do from time to time repetitiously, which is very exciting and still excites me. And I got to do it again this week for the first time in a, in, in a while which is suddenly realized that I'm the first person who's understood something. Well, um, after I did my postdoc in London, I went on to Amsterdam. I was working in the Netherlands, and I worked in a very small biotech company. Was, they had this really amazing chicken virus that had this really amazing protein that just sort of caused cancer cells to commit suicide. But when you put it on healthy cells, it didn't do anything. So it looked like a sort of magic bullet. Uh, and that then led me to my PhD. Uh, I moved up to the northeast of Scotland to the University of Aberdeen to do that uh, and I worked with a guy called Professor Paul Fowler uh, and I have to say that that three years of my PhD was the best three years of my life. Yeah I, 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 I absolutely loved it and I had a very good supervisor, my colleagues were, we had a great team but also it's the fact that I had this freedom to develop my interest and to study an area and make it my own. It was really interesting. I worked on that for a number of years and we worked out the, the pathways behind the specificity, the, the reason that it killed cancer cells and not normal cells. And we patented it, so I was an inventor on a patent. And then the idea was taken up by a big German pharmaceutical company. And the last I heard, this thing had gone into clinical trials, so they were uh, testing it in humans. So for me, oh, that was really strange a uh, quirky project. I'm very, very proud of that work. I absolutely loved it. There was nothing like that buzz of being in the laboratory and getting something to work. And even when things didn't work, you still enjoyed the sort of interaction with people saying, why didn't it work? How can I get it to work? Um, and it really was an amazing, amazing experience. I've manipulated a gene, put it into a bacterial cell, purified and enriched that protein from the bacteria then I've managed to crystallize that, which is it's a, quite a large molecule. It's not like salt, it's about 10,000 times the size of salt. And then shot that with x-rays. I started out trying to understand the control of hemoglobin synthesis. So hemoglobin, as you know, is the protein that carries oxygen. It's bright red in color because it has four protein chains and, two, and four heme groups. And the iron in the heme is what carries the oxygen. Okay, so I was really in intrigued by uh, findings showing that if you deprived these red cells of iron, they didn't make any hemoglobin. Now, they could have made, of course, they couldn't make hemoglobin because they didn't have iron, but they could have made the globin, the protein bit, and then put the heme in later, but they didn't. They actually shut off the protein synthesis. And Richard Jackson, a colleague, a very dear colleague, and I worked on this for... I don't know, a total of about 10 years, I suppose, before we, 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 we cracked it. And then from that, worked backwards to get a, a model of the, the protein at atomic resolutions, knowing where all the atoms are. So when I step back, it's, it's a long process going from gene manipulation all the way to getting a structure, but it's quite exciting when you finally get that structure. Working that out was incredibly satisfying because it went through all kinds of highs and lows. We had to follow a very tortuous path beforehand to work out a lot of things before we got to the point where we could really ask the real question, as it turned out. We didn't know that when we started. but So it was a long and winding road. And then one day, you know, we just suddenly, ta-da! <laughs> You, 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 you get the answer. So. Being a scientist is actually quite a treat because it allows you to carry on being in that, ch that slightly childish, in the best sense of the word, that childish state of asking why. Why is the sky blue? You know, why does the wood catch fire? Why are the flowers coming out in spring? This kind of stuff that all, that all sounds very childish and, and a little bit silly, but actually is immensely profound. And being allowed to carry on asking those questions and actually getting paid for it uh, seemed to be a, a fabulous route through life. Still does. But scientists seem to have found out an awful lot about the world already. Are there any more discoveries to be made? Isn't science more or less all done? 
the total opposite of that. Science, every experiment I do, every result I get, I get three more questions at least from that experiment. Uh, I think there are many, many things that still need to be done. No, I don't think science is finished at all. There are lots of things uh, which we uh, don't know. It's this mystery that always goes on and you think you've got it all sorted and then you ask a question. Maybe you, you regret having asked it because you thought it was all finished and then, oh no. My field in particular, we still have very little idea of how these proteins that exist within membranes actually work. And this isn't just important from a biological point of view. These proteins that exist within the membrane, uh, they are the targets for many, many drugs. Uh, and so because we don't know how they work and what they actually look like, our ability to, des to design specific drugs to act through these molecules is very, very limited. I think there's so many things that still need to be looked at. And I think the biggest challenge, particularly for this generation, is that, is that of energy generation. Energy, I think, is going to be one of the key areas where we're going to see a lot of development. In biology, uh, you could say on the one hand we have been fantastically successful and we know an awful lot, but on the other hand we really don't understand how the brain works actually. I mean, and how, you know, I want to pick up a glass. How, how on earth does my hand just do that? What is the brain doing? I mean, even a simple little creature like a nematode worm, a millimeter long, when it swims and it wiggles, the, 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 the wiring of those electric nervous circuits is not at all well understood, I understand. Science is not dead. It's only beginning, <laughs> right? I think we're only touching the surface. We're just scratching, not even the surface, we're scratching through the dust on top of the surface. I mean, there are layers of complexity and organisation in cells that we really don't understand. I have to choose the most exciting or the most promising question and follow that up. There's lots of questions that are unanswered that I just haven't got the resources to follow up. And then every time you think you even at least know the molecules that are in there, suddenly out of the blue a whole new piece of biology gets discovered. I mean, in the last 10 years or so we suddenly discovered a thing called small interfering RNAs. When I say we, I mean a lot of other people, not me, that nobody had expected were there. And suddenly they're everywhere and a, there was a whole layer of cell regulation that somehow we had just not noticed for 20 or 30 years. I, I mean, it, it, it just strikes me as extraordinary. There'll be another one in the next 10 or 20 years. And I think we still, you know, there are still some profoundly important questions that we don't really understand the answer to at all about, um, in terms particularly of our own uh, bodies. I mean, I, I'm sort of obsessed with how things stay the same. Homeostasis is terribly, terribly important. I mean, if you think about your nose, that's my favorite example. You know, the nose neither grows nor shrinks. I mean, of course, sometimes, you know, you drink too much, it gets inflamed, I suppose. But on the whole, you know, it stays pretty much the same once you're a certain age. So that's pretty amazing, actually. I mean, <laughs> how does the nose know how big it's supposed to be, the, regardless of whether you've had a just had a, eaten an enormous meal or whether you're starving? I mean, it is, it's it's truly remarkable. And to think that it's all sorted is, is completely naive. I think, and and that's great <laughs> because otherwise we'd be out of a job. So there's lots and lots left to do. So clearly, there's still plenty of work for the scientists of the future. No doubt, some of them will win prizes and be commemorated in statues like Darwin here, and so go down in history. But as I hope this film has shown, many of the scientists of the future will be pretty ordinary people like me and you. That's my favorite type of cheese. <laughs> uh, I'm not big on cheese. Uh, let me think. Cheddar. <laughs> it comes and goes. Sometimes I like a good soft blue cheese, other times a nice hard cheddar. It's got to be blue Stilton. 
definitely blue Stilton because I absolutely love it. Just blue cheese is stinkier the better. <laughs> that was a bit of a strange one. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> what is my favourite type of cheese? My favourite type of cheese is Roquefort. I had a piece of Roquefort yesterday and it was delicious. Do I have to choose? Uh, it's really boring, but I think cheddar's got to be sort of feel-good cheese. It's sort of the cheese that cheese of all seasons, cheddar. Mr. Montgomery's cheddar I'm pretty fond of as well. But I think I'd be more upset by the loss of Parmesan because I like making risotto and, and pasta and stuff and sprinkling the cheese. So let's say Parmesan. Coupé. <laughs> <laughs>